Okay, everyone, welcome back. Uh, this is um, this is October the 29th, 2014, and this session is with Fabrice Harari. He's going to begin his WX replication. Okay, Fabrice, it's all yours. Well, hello, everybody. For those who don't know me, um, I'm French, as you can probably hear. Uh, I've been working with uh, pieces of tools for about 20 years, and um, I have been working on different system of replication for more than 10. So uh, I finally decided to create an open source project uh, on replication for the, the tools and uh, put it at the disposition of everybody because clearly there was a big need at that level. And um, I decided that it was time to really, really do something about it. Um, this is an open source under the MIT license. Why this one? because it's the simplest one I was able to find. It's about year big, and it says, do whatever you want with it, just don't go after me. That's all. So that's very simple, and I like simple when I can. Um, of course, you can contact me if uh, there is any problem with it. I'm doing consulting work, so that's how I make a living. Um, the project is available on my website here. And uh, you can uh, contact me with that email or that Skype ID. It's easy enough. I'm quite easy to find on the, on the web. Sorry. At the beginning, of course, I'm not on the good program. OK. So. Um, this is how it's going to work. I'm going first to work on, the, on the, the system itself, tell you everything that you need to know about it. And then in the three afternoon that we have, we're going to have a really hands-on uh, work on it. And I will help you implement the system in your own project if you want to. So if you want to do that, you need to have the source. And to do that, you need to go to my website, create an account, log in, and download it. It's free. You just need to have an account uh, to, to be able to access it. And it is following that menu, menu open source WX replication, before you download, where you have all the disclaimers, of course. And the download button is there. So that is if you want to do some hands-on training. Um, for that, you can work alone. You can work by group if you want. You can work on your own project, or you can work on a project that I will give you. It's a very simple project, one of the pieces of the example. Doesn't matter. It's really entirely up to you, so you, you decide what you, what you want to do. This is how the, the course is going to be organized. The first thing that I'm going to talk about is really about replication in general, what it is, how it works. Um, so the whole theory of replication and, of course, the whole list of problems that you will run into as soon as you implement any type of replication. So that part is going to be extremely generic. Then we'll go to what is available in uh, WinDev out of the box, because there are several options available. And then, at the end, we'll see my system as an alternative to everything that is available before. So, what is replication? Well, clearly it's about data. Um, it's what you need to do when you have several databases, and you need to exchange data between these databases. Basically, it's copying data from one place to another. So, of course, if you say it like that, it's extremely simple, but it becomes complex very fast. Uh, yeah, just another thing. We are recording this session in order for everybody to be able to see that it's an open source project, so the videos will be available for free also. And um, the, the, the presentation itself will also be available for download. So you will have everything that you see here available later if you need it. Let's have a look at where replication uh, comes into uh, play. We start with the most basic setup where you have one user, one database, everything is local. That's 
the basic of what we all do at some point. Then you have several users and one database. At that point, uh, everything is still local or not. The database can be uh, on the web server, can be in another location. So already at that point, we'll have two cases, the local office with everybody working against one database, or people in different offices all working on against one. And of course, as soon as we start working in the real world, it becomes way more complex. And here, this is just a representation of things where you have several databases on the servers, where you have people working against one or another, working with mobile, working with phone. And all that, all that is clearly much more complex. But it doesn't mean that you need replication. At that point, uh, you can still use this kind of thing with a direct link to servers. It's perfectly possible, technically. No, no. Even more complex, and I can really do that all day and just increase it, increase it, increase it. I'm going to stop after that one because the, it becomes really difficult to read. But this is the kind of configuration that you will find in big companies where they have uh, one server in a country, another server in another country, one to get all of Europe, one to get all of Americas, and, and then everything that is centralized. So this is the kind of thing that you will really see. But nothing at that level uh, says that you need replication or not. That's not the criteria to say if it's complex, it's replication. It's not that. Um, if you don't want to use replication, you can have a VPN to connect to an external database uh, and all that kind of stuff that you, I'm pretty sure you've all been doing at some point or another. So that's where you need to think about replication. When do you need it exactly? Well, there are different cases and there are different reasons why you will want to use that system. If you're in a case where some of your users have a bad intermittent connection to the web, Clearly, you cannot rely on that to have them exchange data with a server. Otherwise, at some point, they just cannot work. So um, this, the first thing is, OK, we, we are all living in the real world where sometimes we don't have connection. And some users are, in that case, 80% of the time. The second case is a question of security when uh, you, you're working with a company where an external access to the database, direct access by opening a port and just uh, hitting the database is not allowed. Um, that is something that you see a lot in big companies where they have, they are kind of security conscious. Sometimes they don't really know what they are doing at that level, but they are trying. And they will not allow you to directly access their database. In that case, you can use a web service, of course, but you can also use a replication system. Um, another case is uh, something that happens qu quite, quite often when you have a local uh, office working with their uh, sales system and they create a website. And suddenly they want the website and their local database to be synchronized. So that's a perfect example of where replication comes handy. Yeah, th this slide is also when do you need replication. There are many cases. Uh, you can use replication as a backup system. When your database needs to run 24 hours a day and seven days a week, uh, and you need to backup the data as often as possible, you can just replicate that data into another de database, another server, or several of them. So this way, if your main server goes down, you just switch to the other server, and you're good to go. Um, it is also useful as a load balancing mean. Uh, if you're on the web, by example, you have lots of users coming in. And you can only accommodate that many users per server. So of course, you can have many front-end servers. But at some point, it's your database that is going to be really uh, the, 
the, the weak link. So this, the situation becomes that you have several uh, front-end server, and each of them is going to hit one database on another server, but you will have one, two, three, five, ten databases available on ten different servers. And the, they will all be replicating data between themselves, which means that when a user hits one database, its data is copied everywhere. So if the next time he's coming in, he's hitting another database, the data is there too. That's something that you can use for that. Um, Fault management system, of course, uh, if the server is down, uh, each local user can still continue to work because he's working against a local database, then replicating. And that is something that you will want to implement in every point of sale system. Uh, you, you see some configuration where you have uh, a point of sale system installed in a supermarket. You have 40 lines. That's 40 person uh, entering data all the time. If they're all hitting directly one server and that server goes down, the 40 lines are blocked. Nobody can sell anything. And basically, you have a riot on your hands because the customer don't want to hear about your IT problems. So one way of managing that is to have a local database on each point of sale uh, system. And this is replicating to the server. The server goes down, replication stops. You can still record your data locally. And you can work all the time. It can, it can also be used as a way to reduce cost. Uh, some databases are extremely costly. The license are just killing. Uh, Oracle, MS SQL, and all that are very good databases, but they're expensive. So if you have your main database working against that, you may not want to have to install Oracle on each individual machine. If you cannot, of course, connect directly to the main one. So at that point, you can have the main database in Oracle and the local database using something that is free, like Hyperfile, like Postgres, like MySQL, whatever flavor you, you like. It's perfectly possible to organize things like that. <coughs> and therefore, to uh, have only one big server with a one big database with a one big price tag attached to it. So, up to now, we talked about several databases. They are not connected all the time. And they exchange data when they can when they want or when they need to. Because in some cases, you just don't need to be connected all the time. You can just send the data at the end of the workday to a central server. So there are many, many cases where replication is going to come handy. Now, when we talk about replication, it's a, it's a very uh, big word for lots of different cases. You can have a monodirectional replication where you have, by example, your point of sale sending data to the server, and that's all. You can have bidirectional but partial. This point of sale is also going to receive update to the uh, price list, but that's about it. It's not going to receive anything else. Then you can have also a full bidirectional replication, which is what you're going to use for backup cases, load balancing, all this kind of thing. Then you can have a single level replication where you will have all the local database connecting to one database. So it's a star configuration with only one, one level. Or you can have a multi-level uh, replication where the local database are connecting to original one, the original one to a national one, and then one for the uh, main system of the whole company. So at that level, you're going to have a pyramid. Um, it's also possible to uh, create a system uh, that I call a, a mesh replication system, where each database is not connected to one server, but to at least two of them. And what that does is the same thing that internet is doing. It creates a, a mesh, a network of database, which means that if you lose connection with one database, it's not a problem because you're going to with another one. 
And when you do that, the, uh, you become extremely fault tolerant. Not only do you have your data locally, but it's backed up here and there. And this one is also backed up here and there. And suddenly, everything is uh, extremely solid. And in some cases, it's rare, but it, it, it's happening from time to time. You need to create an ad hoc peer-to-peer -peer replication system. That's a configuration that you will have where, OK, I'm coming to your office with my laptop. Put my laptop in, connect, we exchange data. And then you're going to see this guy over there with your laptop, and you're exchanging data when you arrive there. That's a configuration that I've seen in countries where you have very, very bad communication, and you have sales guys running around the country where they have no phone line, nothing that they can use to really transfer data. So each time they meet somebody, they exchange all the data, theirs and the one from the previous one that they met, and little by little, the data is arriving everywhere. This is, of course, extremely painful, but it is possible. It's also something that you can use, uh, by example, for an app that you would develop for Android or iOS. Well, you want to do some kind of social thing, and people have to meet to exchange data. It can be a game. Uh, you exchange clue to a mystery, whatever, but you have to meet each time somebody else. So these are the kind of uh, cases where you're going to do peer-to-peer -peer ad hoc replication. How does it work? Um, a replication system is going to work in cycles. Uh, most of the time, or nearly all the time, the cycle is going to start on the client side. And it's going to go up to the server and then back. Why? Well, the main reason is that the server is supposed to be available all the time, while the client is going to be connected only from time to time. So the server would have no way of knowing when to push data down, if it was even possible, because at that point the client would have to be the server. So. Generally, when you talk about replication, each cycle starts from the client to the server. Now, um, I'm going to stay away from the words download and upload data, because nobody is up on the mountain and down in the valleys. So that, that just doesn't work really well for a replication system. It, it becomes confusing quite fast. So I'm going to talk about publishing data and receiving data. Um, so the client publishes data, and for that, it needs to identify first what needs to be sent. And you see in that with the different types of replication, either monodirectional, bidirectional, all this kind of thing, it can be completely different depending on the case. Then it needs to extract it from its database, prepare it in one way or another. And at that point, I'm voluntarily really staying at a very high level, just concept. Then transport it to the server. And at that point, the server is going to import that data, send it back to, uh, send back to the client, OK, I got the data. You can mark it as sent. And of course, the client is going to do that again as long as there is data to be sent. Because nothing says that all the data that you have to send has to be sent in one packet or one cycle. The reason for that, again, you can be working in bad communication system. You don't want to send 50 gigabytes of data at once because it will crash all the time. So you send one packet, another one, another one, another one. So that is a cycle. But that's not the only one. Because once the client has sent all its data, he wants to receive new data if there is any available for it. So at that point, the client is going to ask the server for any new data. And now the server has to identify what needs to be sent to that particular client. You may be in a case where you're sending everything to everybody. You may be in a case where you're sending only what pertains precisely to that, uh, that number of users that is there and nothing else. 
there are lots of cases and lots of repercussion for that. Once the server knows what to extract, it does the extraction, prepares it again in a format or another, and then uh, send it back to the client. The client imports the data, tells the server, OK, I got it, and do it again, because again, the server is not going to send all its data at once if he wants to build a, a transport system that is extremely robust. It can, of course, but if you're putting a replication in place, it's probably because you're not sure that the communication system is going to be very good. So you want, most of the time, to send packet by packet. And then at that point, you redo the whole thing starting from the client wants to publish data. And you do that either automatically, manually, it depends on the client, it depends on the application. It's really uh, up to you to decide how you want to do that. So let's talk about what we were talking about before. Identify what data should go where. That's the first problem. And in fact, it's a whole set of problems. Um, the easiest case is when you send everything to everybody. All data is available everywhere. If I go to the, the other office, my data is still there. I just have to log in and access my data. So that's great. Except, of course, it does multiply the, the amount of data that you're sending to everybody for perhaps no good reason. Maybe you need it, maybe you don't. So you may want to identify precisely what you need to send to the database. Be careful, because in replication, we're not talking about users. We are talking about which database contains which data. And on one database, local database, you can have one user or you can have 25. So do you need to send the data and to identify what you need to send at the database level or at the user level? Database level can be, OK, this is this uh, Miami office. So I'm going to send everything that relates to Miami. But I may be sending only things that relate to three guys or four guys, and these guys are moving all the time. So this is a part that can become extremely complex uh, to decide what to do at that level. Uh, of course, not only do you need to decide what you need to do for users or databases, but also what was created since last cycle, what was modified. At that point, you need to decide if you're going to work at the record level or at the field level. That's, that part is extremely important. If you work at the record level, it's simple. Each time a record is modified, you just send the whole record to everybody else, and that's it. But at that point, it's become highly likely that you will find cases where two people in different databases are going to modify the same record. They're not going to modify the same field at that level. They're going to modify one the telephone and one the address. But the last data coming in is going to delete the modification made by the other because you're working at the record level. So it is much simpler, but it is also uh, way less reliable. When you work at the field level, the only case where you're going to lose any kind of information is, is it's when two user on different database are modifying the same field of the same record. It is rare, but curiously, it is less rare than one would think. And the reason for that, and, and you see that uh, very easily on the customer file, by example. There's a new customer, and at the beginning, you don't have all the, the, all the information. But there are several people working with that customer. You have the secretary entering data, you have the sales guy entering data. And because it's a new customer, all these people are working on, the, on that record at the same time. And then you have this conflict happening, just because there's a confluence of things to do on the same record. So that's for the modification. And of course, you also need to identify what was 
deleted in your database. Now, of course, more and more I see that uh, there is no more deletion of records in database most of the time. Uh, very often, there's just a checkbox deleted in the record, and you just check the checkbox. So technically, it's a modification. And why? Because with the different laws on traceability that you have in lots of countries in Europe, and probably in the States too, you're not allowed to physically delete data anymore. You have to have the data stay in your database, be marked as deleted, but it's still there. And you can still see it and audit it and make sure that you're not trying to steal the IRS or equivalent in your country. So deletion has to be supported because you may have some technical deletion to do at one point or another, but it's, it is less and less important because uh, logically you shouldn't do it. The extract data part. At that point, when you arrive at the time when you extract data, you know what to extract. We've seen that before. And you know what was already sent, because you have pointers for that one way or another. That's in every replication system, it's the same thing. But then you can have different ways of doing that. Do you extract? during the replication, or do you pre-extract before that, uh, just like in a, a journal system, a log system, where at the time where you add a record, you also add the information that a record has been added in a log file. If you do it that way, your uh, add, modify, delete are a little longer, but it's really not enough for the user to see it. On the other hand, you have 100 times less work to do during the replication system, the replication cycle, sorry. So uh, you have some replication system working on the journal and wo uh, other working directly against the, the database. In all cases, when you extract the data, you're going to create a packet of data. And that packet, after that, you're going to need to transport. So we have a packet of data. It's, it can be one record if you're doing it extremely, uh, extremely often and there was only one record created. A data packet can be only one record or even one field. You're working on the edit of one field. That's all you're sending. It can be 300 records. You don't know. In every case, you need to uh, copy the packets, send the packet, make sure that the server is getting that packet. And there are many different ways of achieving that. You can, if you are working on the same LAN, just copy the packet somewhere in a directory and let the server read the directory and uh, extract the data from it. That is the system that Pete was describing this morning for his, uh, uh, for his uh, UPS system, where he's putting data in a directory, and the other side is just reading the directory, getting it, and writing the answer, and is getting the answer. That is exactly the same system that you can use for a replication data. You just use a shared directory to put information in and get it in from it. And just like Pete was saying this morning, uh, you will, at that point, name your file with a specific name that tells the server, OK, it is data coming from that database for this database with at that date and time or whatever else you need to know when you read the files so that the files are processed in the correct order depending on your logic. You can do the exact same thing but using FTP. The only difference is that the shared directory is not on the LAN. It's somewhere with an FTP server, and everybody is using that FTP server to access the data. The FTP uh, server doesn't have to be on the data server. The, the data server, the, the nervous system, the, the central piece, can also get the data via FTP. Of course, it will increase communication, because now 
everything has to be transported twice. But not opening FTP on your data server may be a good security measure. <laughs> because FTP is notoriously not very secure. Um, you can also use an HTTP request and a web page or service on the other side. That will be a REST API. Okay, that will be a REST service. Um, the same type that we you saw this morning for PayPal. So we're not the only one doing that. You can, of course, use also web services. And when we talk about it that way, it means that it's a SOAP web service for the communication. You can even use emails. And uh, yesterday, Glenn was talking about using emails uh, to send uh, information between different parts of different programs. Absolutely. Of course, there's one big problem with that. It's the spam filter. There's a good chance that some of your emails are not going to arrive, and you have to manage that. Now, it's OK because there's also a trick. And it's a trick that comes from the dark side of civilization. It's a trick that is used by people who don't want to be intercepted when they send message. They all use the same email address. They create an email, put it in a draft folder, never send it on the mail server. And the other guy goes into the log into the mail server, look in the draft, read information, delete it. The email was never sent. Once again, we are not sharing a directory this time, we are sharing a folder inside the mail server. And we are doing the exact same thing that we are doing here, naming, using the title of the email to name the packet and have uh, the information this way used by anybody who needs it. Um, you don't need to attach file to the email because that is another kind of worm. You can have your data directly in the body of the email encoded in the base64, by example. And because when you prepare the packet, you can choose how you prepare the packet, packet format. You can directly, from the beginning, use a text format that you just stuck into the email, put the title, and put it in the draft folder. So that, that is a solution, basically, where uh, you just use uh, Gmail bandwidth <laughs> to do your replication. Can be fun. Of course, you can go old school and use a physical medium. Uh, you can use a USB dongle if you're not afraid of bad USB. Uh, you can burn everything on a DVD and send the DVD via mail. And that is a solution that is used by some people who do not allow any type of internet connection on their system. For simply security reason or paranoia reason, I don't know, but somebody is out there together, so you, you decide. Um, you can also use sockets. In uh, W language, we have good socket function, so you can directly uh, talk to a, a socket somewhere else and basically replace um, a, a web server with your own system. Perfectly possible. Is it a good idea? Depends on the case. I don't. I never had to do that that way, but it's, it can be fun. Of course, you can, again, use somebody else's bandwidth and hard drive by using a virtual hard drive like uh, Google Drive, uh, Dropbox, or whatever you want. Once again, you're going to share a directory, but this time it is somewhere that you don't even manage. So that is a solution that is great because you don't have to manage your own server or anything like that. But because of the way these virtual hard drives are working, you're going to just put your file into your local directory. It's going to be synchronized by the, 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 the software directly in the cloud somewhere. And then it's going to go everywhere on every machine that has the same uh, drive attached. Which means that this thing is going to multiply the, 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 the amount of communication tremendously. So if you don't want to have that problem, then you need to use the API that comes with those 
uh, Google Drive, uh, Dropbox, they all have an API that allows your software to directly write in that directory without having a local one. And then you return to um, communication that are much smaller. Of course, you have much more to code and you become specific to one uh, hard drive, uh, virtual hard drive provider because their API are completely different from one to the next. So this is all the different ways I thought of to transport packets. It doesn't mean that I implemented all of them. I implemented one, I chose one. But um, depending on what you need, what you want, you can use all this kind of system to transport data. Now, uh, once your data arrived on the server, it needs to import it. Once your data comes back to the client, it needs to import it too. So the principle is exactly the same on server and client. Uh, you do need to know where the data is coming from, if only for security reason and to make sure that uh, you're receiving data from authorized people, that um, you're not receiving the same data twice, and all this kind of thing. So uh, you have to have a way to identify the packets and make sure that they are legit and that you're working on the correct data. Um, once you're sure that is the case, you have to manage your packets. They're in a format that you decided, that the system decided, so you unsplit, uncheck, unpack, do everything with the packets. Um, in some cases, you don't even send one packet in one file. You cut it in very small files and you send them one after the other. That's something that you do when you have really a slow communication, like a 56K modem. And yes, some people still are using that. To be sure that you have as much data coming up before your line crashes in the middle of a file. So in that case, you have to unsplit and all this kind of wonderful thing. Then you read the content. You verify that the content is valid by whatever mean is necessary. By example, you can check that your analysis is the same on both sides. May be a good idea to do that. In some cases, it's not. In some cases, you can have a replication system where the analysis can be different on both sides. So that's not mandatory. You verify the file format. You verify that the data has not been already sent because the client can be stuttering and sending you data again and again. So you want to make sure that it's not the case. Then you have to write the data in the database. And the fun part starts there because you have to manage duplicates. And there are two types of uh, duplicates. You have the technical duplicates where you have a unique key on something and you're trying to add a record with the same unique key, which is bad, always. And you have the logical duplicates, where you have a key that is not unique, like a customer name, and you have a John Smith being added and you already have a John Smith. Is it the same? Is it not the same? What do you do? All that, we're going to talk about that in details, because that's really, really a, a big problem as soon as you work on replication. And once you know, you decide what you have to do, you may have to merge records. If the two John Smiths are the same, you may have at some point to say, okay, now I'm going to make only one record out of the two John Smiths. Of course, it's never that simple because John Smith is linked, is linked to invoices, so now the invoices has to be linked to the same record, is linked to a company. So now all the links have to be managed. And if you had in that record a counter, number of times the customer went into a store, you have to add the two counters, not just replace one by the other. So the merging of records is a whole thing in itself and it, it can become extremely complex. Once the data is imported, it doesn't matter if it's 
server or client, you always need to send an acknowledgement to the other side. Because you need to know that you got data up to that point, but the, peop the person, who, the database who sent the data also needs to know that you integrated that data so it doesn't send it again. And that's why, that's at the, that level, if you have a problem, that you can have some stuttering and sending the data again and again. But it's extremely important um, to send an acknowledgement. You don't want to redo something if it's already imported, but you do want to redo the process if the data was not correctly imported. So you have to manage those cases. Of course, you need to manage pointers. The pointers can be, depending on the type of the replication you're using, there can be uh, one pointer for the whole database, or there can be one pointer per file in the database. Uh, it depends on uh, how you're managing things. Um, you have to code for fault tolerance. If data hasn't been received, you have to manage that case, and you have uh, to make sure that you're going to re-ask for the data. Now, the data may have been received, but the acknowledgement may have not. So you also have to code in order to tolerate that uh, you didn't say, you didn't hear, okay, I got the data. Didn't hear it. So what do you do? All that has to be taken into account. It is very fast becoming extremely complex. Um, once the, the acknowledgement has been sent, you can just send, okay, I got your data, or you can send, okay, I got your data, and here's my data. It depends how you work, if you work by packet or not. Uh, that depends on the replication system you're using. And of course, at the the communication at the level of the acknowledgement is exactly done the same way than the uh, packet transport. You're transferring information. It doesn't matter if it's from the database or from the replication system. You're not going to use two different communication methods uh, to do that. So to send an acknowledgement, you may have to create a file empty with just uh, the ID of who is supposed to receive it and, OK, it's good. That may be just that. And of course, you have to do that again and again and again, depending on what data you have to send, how often you want to uh, get the data. <clears throat> but each cycle, start from the client, go to the server, comes back, is independent. It's one cycle. You send data, you request data, you get the data, you're done. After that, either you repeat it automatically, every minute, every 10 minutes, whatever you need, or you do it manually. The user is going to press the button to send data. And that is a case that you will see a lot in uh, mobile. When you're working with a phone, a tablet, something like that, you don't want your program to spend its time sending data, receiving data, even if there's nothing to send just the cost that is going to, you're going to incur with uh, data communication from your carrier is going to be horrendous. So most of the time, you're going to check, do I have Wi-Fi? Then I may be doing that. If I don't have Wi-Fi, I'm not sending anything. You can also just tell the user, you haven't synchronized your data since yesterday. Do you want to synchronize now? Yes? OK, synchronize. So. All that has to be part of the replication system, of course, but it's not inside. It's outside how you manage your replication and how you uh, really uh, drive your replication system. Um, the replication can be done from um, near real time and anybody who says that the replication is real-time is a liar. Just because you have to transport data, it means that it's not real-time. So uh, you always have to remember that real-time doesn't exist. You will be in near real-time if you do that all the time. And of course, the, the amount of communication is going to increase tremendously because you're going to do a lot of cycles for nothing. 
or it can be once a week, once a day, once a month, depending on what you need. If you're just sending statistical data, once a month, maybe anything, everything you need. Because of all that, because of all the things that we've seen before up to that point, data can be stale. And I will never say it enough, when you work on a replication uh, system, data can be stale. And what does that mean? It means that I'm working here, I'm doing things on my program, and I'm not synchronizing with the server. Then I'm going on vacation for two weeks. And when I come back, I send my replication. My data is two weeks old. People may have modified the same record somewhere else during that time, and all data is going to override new data. This is going to happen. There is no way to prevent that, because there is no logical, programmatical way of knowing for sure that this data is stale. Even if the date is older, it doesn't mean that the data is not valid. So there is no automatic way of solving that problem once and for all. Anybody who tells you that a replication system will always magically know which data has to be incorporated and which hasn't is lying to you. It's just not possible. So your application, your application, not the replication part, but your application has to be created or modified for it. You need to be able to manage this. Um, and that, that is something that is not in documentation of PC software or their internal tools. Let's suppose, as usual, that you know everything that there is to know about replication and that, therefore, you are able to choose for yourself what to use, how to use it, and how to manage your application. This is not happening. I see that all the time. People are using the, the replication system and they don't modify their application accordingly. So in WX replication, you're getting also a how-to, step-by-step, how to modify your program to make it work with replication. And all that, all these problems are talked about. Maybe not enough, but believe me, I spent a lot of time working on it, so you should have some, uh, a few things to read. Now, Let's have a look at the kind of problems that uh, you will have in a replication system. And I didn't say you may have. I said you will have. Because that is a given. It is part of the replication paradigm. There's no question about it. So of course, the first one is the duplicate management. We already talked about that. But even that has different subcases. Yellow. You have. You're selling products and you have a color file. Nothing more stupid than a color file. You have yellow, red. Two different guys on two different databases are creating a yellow. And suddenly you have two yellow to choose from when you're managing a product. Not important, maybe, but when you do statistics by color for yourself, suddenly you have part of it on one yellow, another part of the other. Are the two yellow the same? Or is one yellow PC soft yellow and the other one, uh, canary yellow, bright yellow, dark yellow. So how do you manage that? There are several solutions for that. One is to say only one guy is authorized to create a color. I've seen people managing it that way, which is great. As long as the guy is not in vacation and uh, somebody needs to enter a new product. At that point, it becomes not so great. Um, the other way of doing that is to say, okay, we have a duplicate, and therefore we need either to modify the name of one record to know that we're working with something else, or we need to merge them. And that means data management. It means that somebody has to take the decision. Then we go back to Mr. Smith that we are talking about before. And again, we have that problem. Um, is it the same Mr. Smith? Is it another one? 
you can have 10 Mr. Smiths in your customer file. How do you recognize which one is what? When the customer comes to your office, with what recall are you going to work? It may be that it's really a duplicate, in which case you will have to merge information. But it, it also may be that you have two different Smiths and that you have to modify your application in order to make sure that when you display something, uh, a, a, a selector for customer, you have not only the name, but also the city, the phone number, the email, whatever information is going to allow you to precisely identify the record you have to work on. And you end up with the lady at the, at the store asking, uh, what is your phone number? <laughs> what is your email? Uh, how do you identify somebody if you don't have a unique key? Um, then you have the case of the invoice number. Of course, you cannot have two invoices with the same number in the system. It doesn't matter if it's replicated or not. I don't think that your accountant or the IRS is going to be happy if you do this kind of thing. So, um, how do you manage that? Well, very often in, in programs you will see that the invoice number is just the automatic ID of the record, which is fine on a normal system. All the records are created in the same place. It's not fine for a replication system. So, there are several ways of doing that. One is to have, to incorporate inside the invoice number the database ID. So you're saying this is the Paris invoice number 20. And this is the New York invoice number 20. And that, okay, it's legal everywhere, no problem. Um, for that, suddenly, you need to manage a database ID. Well, I have good news for you. Any replication system manages a database ID in order to know what's going on, so you may rely on that. Um, another way of doing that is to use uh, invoice number that are completely different with series of number coming from, uh, just like PCSoft is doing in some case, you will have uh, one uh, database where the, the invoice will go from one to 10,000 and the next one from 10,001 to 20,000. You can do something like that also. But that also means that your existing application will have to be modified to accommodate replication. Um, integrity management. That's another problem. How do you make sure that when you create, by example, an invoice, you have both the header and all the lines going to the server at any given time. The user may be creating the invoice right now when the replication cycle is working. So it may have under only half the lines. So do you use a transaction? And what do you do when there's a rollback? Um, or are you just going to be fault tolerant? You're saying, okay, in any case, I'm going to write first the invoice header and then the lines. If I replicate and I don't have all the lines, is that such a big deal? At some point, next replication cycle, I will get the remaining lines. And during that time, I just have incomplete information. And that is something that you are always in when you are in replication. You always have incomplete information because information is being created everywhere and you don't have it yet. So you have to get out of the mindset that this is my database, everything's in it. Everything that is in my database is the whole world, I have all the information right there. It's not true in replication. You have to create your system to be uh, fuzzy, fuzzy logic, good enough data. That's, and, and, and it's extremely difficult when you've been taught again and again and again that you have to be completely square, that everything has to be perfectly managed. Suddenly, with the replication, it's not possible anymore. So, 
the problem that we talked about before is clearly a big one. You will have stale data coming in after the new data. And in a replication system, the only way of managing that is last in wins. So the last data that arrives on the server is the data. So how do you manage that? Automatically, you cannot uh, detect in every case that data is stale. So you have to do that in um, another way. And one way of doing that is to keep a history of all the modification that happen on any field. If you do that, and you say, but that's not the correct phone number. I entered another phone number last week. Where is my phone number? If you look in the history of the field, you have, OK, that's the data, the current data, and the previous data. And you can go back if necessary. You can do whatever you need. But that's, again, that is going to be at the level of your program. Mm. Yeah. Um, if you decide that you're going to send only a some data to each database. By example, we have one database here on the right side of the, of the class and another one on the left side. I don't want to send your data to them. They don't need it. Okay. But what if tomorrow you decide to sit there? You connect to your database and you don't have your data. Suddenly, the choice that I made to uh, reduce the amount of communication is biting me in the ass. So are you in the situation where uh, people are not moving around, they're always on the same database? Or are you in a situation where uh, it, it can happen? Now, I can still only send your data here, but it means that when you log in here, you don't have your data. I must have a mechanism that say, OK, your data is not here. Wait, I'm going to request your data to the server and get it, which is an extra step, and it may take quite a long time, just because, well, you don't have uh, the possibility to transfer 20, your 20 gigabytes of data just like that. Um, so uh, you can also send the whole data to everybody. You increase the amount of communication, of course, and the amount of work that everybody, every database has to do. But at that point, you can use queries and filter on the database to show only your data on this side of the class and your data on that side, just by saying, OK, I don't want to see everything else. So you increase the communication, but suddenly, if you go on the other side and you log in, you are authorized to see your data, and you can access it. And that's another way of doing things. And be careful. There is not one good way of doing that. It is really completely dependent of your application and what you need. So um, you have that problem added to the mix. You were authorized to see data for your department. You're changing department. Suddenly, your data set change. If it's just a question of changing your rights and all the data is there, you just access your new data. If it's not that and you had only your data sent to you, you have to replicate everything again. So it is a problem that is happening in all kind of configuration. And you have to really think about how your users are behaving before deciding on one system or another. Now that, that is, of course, is a huge problem. As soon as you start using a replication system, you don't do any local backup anymore, ever. Because if you do a local backup, at some point, somebody is going to do a restore. And it's going to crash your perfectly replicated database by an old database with all the pointers completely incorrect, with a data set that is completely old, you're going to kill your system if you do that. So this, 
as soon as you put a replication system in place, you remove your backup and restore system from your application if you had one. And if the customer was doing a local backup using any kind of uh, software, you remove that too. But otherwise, this will bite you in the ass, and it, this one will be very painful. Very, very painful. Looks like I had some problem at the table. <laughs> The choice of uh, record level or field level, we already talked a little bit about it. So the, the record level is easier, but information may be lost. Uh, field level is better, but more complex and slower. Now, the slower part is not always true. Because on the one hand, you need to have more processing in order to manage only one field instead of the whole shebang. On the other hand, you're sending less data via the communication. So depending of where your bottleneck is, is your communication very slow? Field level is good. Are your machine very slow? Field, field level is bad. For the conflict resolution, there is no other solution in my experience than last in wins. You may be tempted to implement a very clever system where you detect the fact that uh, two people modify the same information during the same cycle, or the same 10 minutes, or the same hour, or whatever, and pop an alert saying, hey, somebody else did the same thing on your that field and put something else in it, just like uh, PC stuff is doing when you're working locally. And at that point, one thing and one thing only will happen. The user will say, oh, my data is better. There is, I've never seen anybody say, oh no, my data is crap, his data is much better. No, no, I've never seen that, ever. I don't know why exactly, but I've never seen that. Which means that your whole implementation where you spent three days working to make sure that you display things in a meaningful way, and that of course everybody is going to, co to, to comprehend what you're talking about, yeah, sure. Um, that is all for nothing. That is really a waste of time. And I'm saying that because I did implement that. And then we did some tests. That was a sad day. I was really proud of my thing. OK. Um, next problem. As you can see, I have a quite a big list of problems. And I hope that by telling you about it today, I will not uh, discourage you of using replication, but, at, but only prevent you from hitting the same walls that I had to hit with my head repeatedly in different times and places. And we're talking about different places. When you're working with a central database, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, all your users are at the same place. When you're working in replication, very often, your users are going to be in different time zones. Because of that, suddenly you have to store your date and times in UTC. You cannot store date and time in local time, because otherwise, basically, you don't know what time you're talking about. So you have still to display it in local time, because otherwise, no user is going to understand what's going on. That also thing. And of course, you have to reconcile the different local times when you're working on any kind of scheduling function. If you're trying to arrange a meeting between you and you, and you have three hours of difference, you have to have a meaningful way of displaying that into your scheduler in order for that to uh, work properly. Now, why am I talking about that? That has nothing to do with re replicating data by itself. But this is a problem that you're going to have and it means that you're going to have to modify your application in order to manage that. And it's important that you know what you have to do in order for a system, a replication system, to be successful. Another thing that you have to do in case like that is always know who is where. Because it's not because I live in Guadeloupe and therefore I'm in UTC minus four most of the time that I'm not going to be in Paris at some point, or in California. And it means that at that point, my local time is completely different. So 
you at that point need to be able to say, okay, this user now is there. And you have to make sure, one way or another, that you have the correct information. Um, not a problem. Very often, you're going to uh, start to have different currencies. So, how do you store uh, your money in your database when sometimes it's in euros, sometimes it's in yen, sometimes it's in dollar? Uh, what information do you store? Remember that when you store uh, currency information in database, at some point you're going to want to add all your money to know what you're making or what it's costing you and you're going to want to make comparison. So do you store it in each original currency or in one pivot currency? And in order to do that, you have to calculate and use an exchange rate. Which one do you use? The, your bank exchange rate? Your, uh, some kind of government exchange rate? Today exchange rate? Imagine, if, you, if you're billing today, doesn't mean that you're going to be paid today. So are you going to use the date of the billing to do that, or the date of the payment? And you're going to have suddenly, if you do it at the two different time, you're going to, uh, to, to register your invoice at the invoice date and the payment another time. One of the currency information is going to be the same, hopefully. The other one will not. Now you have currency difference to manage in your application that you didn't have before. Also, you have to be careful about what is legal where. Uh, it's not because here in the States you are legally authorized to work one way that your subsidiary in France is going to be authorized to work the same way. So it may be that in France you are authorized to use one yearly rate, which is a medium rate calculated by some magical means by the government. Uh, but here, you have to use today's rate. So suddenly, you have to know what is going on where and what rules to apply where. And that's where, Glenn, business rules come extremely handy because you can code that and use the compile function to apply on the fly, different rules depending of the different legal situation, the country situation. Now, of course, we arrive at the different languages. I am guessing that most of you have been uh, working, for the most part, in a one language situation. If you start uh, answering uh, m problems that need replication, there's a good chance that you're going to have different languages in play. Now, doesn't mean that it's different countries. If you go to Switzerland, it's one country, four languages, four official languages. So that's one thing. But if you use English in your program, it can be for US, UK, uh, Canada, whatever. So different language. It's not the same with different countries. You also have the problem of different countries. And it, they are completely separate. So you have to manage that at the level of the application. Your GUI has to be translated for different things. And it's not because I live in France that I want to have my UI in French. I'm working on software in, uh, in France or in English. I prefer to do it that way because translation is a... Uh, Never had that. I would win there, I think, like that. Okay. Um, so you have the application itself, but then you have the content. And at the content level, it becomes even more complex. Um, of course, you can say, I'm working in French and English, so in my file, I'm going to put the, the title of my, the name of my product in French and the name of my product in English. Well, that is a solution that may work in some cases but will not work in a lot of them. First, it's not because you created a product that you can translate the name of that product immediately. You don't speak French. You created the product, then you have to send that to the translator, who two months later will come back to you with a translation for the name, correct 
or not. That's another problem. So what do you do when you don't have the information in the file? And you have to display that product. Do you display it back in the only language that you have? That is what PCSoft is doing. If, if you don't have the translation for a button uh, caption, they are going to display the other one, the main one that is there. And suddenly, you have your product in uh, the French catalog in English. Mm -hmm. May not be what you want. Also, you may not have all the product for sale in every country. Because you just some products are just not legal here, and they're legal in France or the country. So that means that the only solution that is going to work all the time is to have a country information in, 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 in your product file, in that case. And you will have a different list of products for France than you will have for the US. My website, where I manage two languages, I don't have the same content on both sides. By example, the whole WX replication uh, thing is available only in English. I didn't take the time to translate that in French. I just didn't have it. So I have all my article, all things like that, on the English side, nothing in the French one. Oh yeah, I have one page saying, if you want it, it's over there, in English. So the only way that will work all the time is to manage content per, and the per depends on you. It can be per language, which is the case on my website. It can be per country. It can be both. We're talking about Switzerland, French, German, Italian, Roman. So you need four different translations for the product, and it's only one country. So are you using the same French for Switzerland and France and Quebec or different ones? That's just right there is a full problem by itself. We have the five slides on problems. Better than you know before. Up till now, we have been talking about synchronizing data uh, only between databases of your application. But that's not the only type of replication synchronization that exists. You may also need to synchronize data with other application databases, by example, Outlook. That's one case that uh, hap is happening very often. Uh, your user is receiving his email in Outlook, and you need to get in there and incorporate the email in your database in order to be able to do search process, say that email is going to that, uh, uh, that project, and all that have all your information where you need it. Um, can be Outlook, Thunderbird, accounting software, whatever. So you need to be able to do that too. The problem is that at that point, basically, each case is different because each program, each external program, without will have its communication mechanism or not. They may not have anything done for that. Um, of course, each will have it, its own database schema, and you will not know it. It will be completely different than yours, so you will have to adapt. Worse than that, some, and Outlook is directly coming to mind, do not have a reliable, unique ID per record. Outlook is absolutely amazing that way. You have an email, it has an ID. You take the email, you change the folder of the email. It's a new ID. They didn't move the record. They created a new one and deleted the old one. And you're trying to, suddenly, your, uh, your email disappeared on you. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one was good, too. Because you have to understand what's going on, and then you have to find a way. So also another problem is that most of the system do not keep track for you of what was edited or deleted. They are just records that are there. They are not telling you that this is new. They're not telling you that this was modified or that this was deleted. It, you're on your own. So because you're not using the same ID in your system than they're using in theirs, if they have a reliable ID, you will need translation tables. And translation table is what? A file in your database where you're saying, 
my ID equal his ID. That's all. If you have a reliable ID. If you don't, then you cannot do that. In that case, what you do is each time you want to synchronize, you copy the whole damn file, and then you compare to the, the previous copy that you had, record by record. And you see what was deleted, something is missing, what was added, and what has changed field by field. And then you synchronize that to your database. It can be uh, quite slow. So that's a good series of problems uh, that you may have when you start exchanging data. Um, another problem that you can have is how do you manage documents, external files of your database? Uh, Word file, XLS, JPEG, whatever. If you store them in a blob in your record, then it's part of your record, and it will synchronize with the database. Um, of course, it will increase the size of the database. That's clear. And some people don't like that. The problem is that if you keep your uh, file outside of the database, and uh, you just keep a path pointing to that record, then you have a whole lot of problem added to your system. Suddenly, you have a local path. On this machine, the file is there. But where is going to be that file when it arrives on the database here? You cannot access it there. You have to transport it and put it somewhere. And you may have a D drive that you don't have. So you cannot just suddenly, for each data client database, you need to have a path translation system in place, which is a pain. Of course, you need to add your outside document to your packet one way or another. Uh, another thing that you have to manage when in that case is to separate uh, directory per user. When you're having all the data coming from all your users, you can have the same name my invoice for five different documents. They may be even on the same directory on your local machine. So it means that when they go somewhere else, they need to be per database, per user, per whatever you need to make that different. As you can see, I kind of prefer the blob system personally, but <laughs> just me. Um, and of course, if it's outside the database, you also have to be able to detect that something has changed inside those documents in order to synchronize that change uh, somewhere else. So um, that's a lot of work, a lot of extra work. And um, because of that, I really prefer the uh, data inside the record directly in the blob. Some people will tell you, I don't want to do that because it will slow down my queries. Well, it doesn't have to. What I do very often if I have this kind of problem, I just create one file in my database, or one table, depending on the lingo of the database in question, that is just a blob. I have a key, and I have a blob. That's all. And after that, each and every of my record that needs a blob is just pointing to that say, I'm using the blob 23. It's very easy, just like an index. Because of that, all my queries on the main records are as fast as they were before. And when I need to display the blob, transfer the blob, do whatever on the blob, I'm going to read that extra record. No big deal. And uh, it solves the problem. Um, now, the last problem, of course, is when you edit the same document on several machines, you suddenly need to be able to have a version management in place, in place for your documents. So, so, that was the last part of the full theory. Now we're going to talk about a little bit about what exists in um, the PCSoft product. 
And they have, in fact, four different replication systems in place. Not one, not two, not three, four different. The first one works only on Hyperfile Classic. Why? Because it is using the journalization system that is available only on Hyperfile Classic. Um, if you're in that case, it's, of course, it's the oldest one that appeared a long time ago. They can create magically uh, some replication file that after that you have to transport. And they're not managing any transport at that level. Only HF Classic, not very useful. I think that you can forget about that one. Then they have what they call the universal replication. And the idea is very good. Uh, it allows them to say, OK, we can do any type of database. We're going, as long as they have the same analysis, we can transfer data back and forth between Classic, Server, Oracle, etc. Once again, transport is up to you. There's no transport mechanism in that. Um, what they're doing at that level is they're using automatic IDs to uh, manage their uh, identity, their record identity at the workgroup level. And they're saying, OK, from here to there, it's that this database, from there to there, it's this database, and so on and so forth. They're using interval of automatic ID per database. Then they added the replication of uh, HF SQL servers. And that is great. If you have different uh, hyperfile server everywhere, you just go in each hyperfile server, Click replication, replicate to that one, click, 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 up, oh, you go on the other one, click, 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 done, start replicating. Fantastic. Only hyperfile server. It's the only one that uh, is supported. And we'll go into the problems later. <laughs> and then you have something that not a lot of people know, and it's the cluster management. Hyperfile SQL support a cluster system where you have and servers, and they're in real time, that's what they're saying at least, they magically have all the data going everywhere. You can get the HF SQL cluster just by requesting it uh, at the technical support of PCSoft. It's the only way. There's no download. You ask for it, I send it to you. Don't ask me why. I don't know. So, we've seen what exists. Now let's talk about what's good about it. Well, the first thing that is good about it is that it's available. Clearly, well, you want replication, you have four systems. What are you asking for? It is, for most, the most part, simple to implement. In some cases, it's just a few clicks. Of course, when you're talking about a replication system and there's no transport mechanism, you still have all that to code. It's working always on the automatic ID system. So you don't have to change your, the way you're coding if you're already using automatic ID. So that's, that's good. And uh, they have a filtering system for most of the, the cases where you can create one function that will see for each record if it has to be sent or not via the replication. So you can filter the data. All that is really good. Now, that's the bad part. They expect you to know everything there is to know about replication. But now you know a little more about replication, so that should be easier to use. There are only a few pages of help available, which is good. It means that it's extremely simple. But now, the main problem for me, and that's that's really what I've seen uh, by experience when you see in the forum people using this system. At some point, you see a guy popping his head up and say, it's not working anymore. I've been replicating for three months or six months. Everything was fine. And yesterday, it stopped working. I didn't change anything. What happened? <laughs> Nobody knows. 
and I'm saying nobody knows, it means nobody, not Microsoft, not me, not the, the, nobody. Why? First, because there are only a few pages of help available. Second, because PCSoft has no way of duplicating that problem. And third, because there is absolutely no debug tool available to know what's going on. You have no clue. Of course, at that point, you're three months or six months into a replication system, and your customer is starting to load his gun. I don't like this kind of situation. So, uh, that for me is the main reason why I don't use their system and why I created a whole replication system uh, by code, open source, so that you can debug your program. I don't think that it's uh, unreasonable to ask for a way to debug something. We don't have it. For me, it's not usable. Of course, if you think about the whole list of problems that we talk about, there is absolutely nothing in their replication system that manages any of them. You have to manage that in your application. And that may be why the replication is failing. It's perfectly possible that these guys are in the case where there's a duplicate, they are not managing it correctly, and the replication system just stalls, doesn't know what to do with it. It's absolutely possible, but nobody knows. So, how do you debug that? Um, so, if you don't believe me, you search on the forum, mostly the French forum, because there are quite a few people who try to use these things, and you will see regularly it works, and then it doesn't. And if you find a solution somewhere, tell me, because I haven't seen one. Um, of course, the transport is not available. There's no duplicated data management. Integrity problems, maybe they're managed, maybe they're not. We don't know, it's a black box, so you don't really know what's going on. So all the problems are there. I'm so sorry for you. Mm -hmm. To every device in the system. That's great. <laughs> I, I'm going to repeat that for those of you who didn't uh, hear it. Um, Jeff was using the universal replication system, and there was a, a power problem that created an index problem on one of the database, and the replication system just duplicated the index problem everywhere. Which is great. It means that the replication is working. <laughs> no? Sounds logical to me. What time is it? Okay, nearly. Nearly time for the, the break. <coughs> mm. And now we arrive at really the subject of this presentation. WX replication. Now you know why I've spent three months of my life working like crazy on that thing to finish it in time for this, <laughs> this conference. Uh, of course, it's not the first replication system that I wrote. I wrote several. Um, and they were not all using the same system. Uh, so I had to uh, choose a system that would match my requirement list. So, this is what I did. The first thing and the most important thing, I try to follow the KISS principle. Anybody doesn't know that one? No? Yeah, okay, everybody knows it, perfect. Uh, I tried to keep the system as simple as possible in order for it to be usable and to be uh, debuggable when you have a problem. Of course, that may be difficult because you've seen that the problem itself is quite complex. I tried. Now, the second part is even more important for me. It's the lowest common denominator. For those of you who were not listening in math class, it means that I tried to use only a kernel of function, low-level function, that would be available on as many platforms as possible and against as many databases as possible. 
So I try to stay away from anything fancy that will not work on uh, SQLite, on Postgres, on this, on that, or in Java, or whatever. Um, so that's what I try to do. Of course, at that point, it hasn't been tested against all the environments. So I may be completely wrong in thinking that I succeeded in doing that, but that, that's what I try to do. And that's for that reason that in the future, in the, in the advancement plan of the, of the project, there is the fact that it's going to be tested against other databases. Maybe you will do this kind of test because you will want to use it with Postgres. I'm sure that Pete is waiting for Postgres to use that. <laughs> You're a convert? Okay. Mark held me down and just kept pouring the hyperfile Kool-Aid, and then he showed me a picture of the hyperfile uh, expert from the version 20 brochure, yeah. and I'm converted. Okay, good. It not look anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, also in the future, it is a plan to work on iOS, on the Mac, on Linux, all this kind of thing. Currently, WX replication works and has been tested on Android, Windows with WinDev, and WebDev. And not WebDev uh, Linux and not WebDev PHP. I don't do this kind of thing. It's don't, not my thing. So it's already available and it's already a solution for all this environment. And that should cover the majority of the cases because from what I've seen, that's the most used platform everywhere. Um, we are going to talk about each technical choice that I made. I'm not just going to tell you this is how it is. I'm going to tell you why I made those decisions so that you can decide if it's working for you or not and if it is going to be usable for you or not. Um, one thing that is important, it has been developed in version 19, so if any of you is still using 18, it's time to upgrade. And the reason for that is that, especially for the mobile environment, each version adds a lot of functions. And if you go back to 18, I'm pretty sure that the code that I wrote for Android will not work. Some of the function. I use one, uh, at least one function I know that appeared in 19. And if I don't have that function, it means that I have to recode it myself. And that's going to be a lot, lot of code. And that's one case. So, uh, 19. Um, with the uh, replication system, with WX replication, I have coded and included a number of tools in order to help you uh, implement that in your application. These tools allow you to test that the system is working, to debug it. Uh, they help you know what you have to do in your, uh, in your project in order to move it to the replication part. And we're going, of course, to uh, dig into all that. But it's not a black box. It's fully open. And there are tools that I developed, if only for me, because the first thing I did after I stopped uh, was to use it into uh, one of my own projects. And while doing that, I said, OK, how do I find out that this and that? And so I added tools to the system. That's why you need to have the uh, 092. If you have downloaded the project a long time ago, you need to re-download it. It's the 092 version that is the current one. So, WX Replication is open source. Currently, it is working only against HF Classic and Client Server. Uh, on Android, it's HF Classic. On Windows and WebDev, it's whichever you want of Classic or Client Server. This doesn't mean that it will not work against MS SQL or anything like that. It means that it hasn't been tested at all in those cases. So. It, in theory, it should work exactly the same way. But as long as I haven't tested it or somebody doesn't tell me, okay, it's good, I used it with this and that, 
Also something that you have to realize, it is working the same way than the universal replication at that level. You can have one database on one side and a completely different one on the other. It doesn't matter. It's not relying on one type of database everywhere at all. There is, at the time, uh, sorry. Yeah, said that. Um, the transport mechanism is included. And I chose to implement it using HTTP request on the client side and an AWP page on the web dev server side. Your server for this system is going to be a web dev page, one page. You have a second page to maintain the database. That's it. So you need to have two pages up there. Um, currently, at the time I wrote that slide, I had only 23 pages of documentation available on my website. That does not include the 85 slides that I have here, but most of what I was, I'm telling you about the replication system are in those pages as detailed as I was able to write them. Um, in case of problem, you can debug. You have the whole source. It's not a black box at all. Of course, you can customize the system to adapt it to your needs, which is something that you cannot do with the, uh, the built-in uh, system. And if something is not available or not available yet, you can code it. You can also ask me to code it for you. No problem. Just send me a check. We'll, we'll talk. Um, I have to say at that level that um, I have to thank one guy, and I cannot give you his name. It's kind of funny. Um, when I started working on that, I was uh, contacted by one of my customers who uh, had this, this exact need. And I told him, well, I am working on it. It should be available at the end of October. And he told me, it's too late. I need it beginning of September. Sorry, but I have other things to do. I have to work for my customers, too. I need to eat from time to time. So I cannot do it right now, except if you want to sponsor part of it. And he did. Send me a check. In fact, he sent me a PayPal money transfer without even asking for an invoice first. Just suddenly there was money there. Great guy. Um, he doesn't want his name to be said. So I will respect his wishes, but I had one sponsor for this project, and it must be said, it's nice to see somebody like that. So I can tell you that I was coding very, very fast to give him what he needed in time. Um, of course, uh, if you compare the, the replication system that are built into uh, WinDev, and this, this to put in place is going to be much more complex initially. And it should be more complex because in the how to uh, uh, implement the system, uh, the, the document that you're going to see at the end, uh, I'm talking about all these problems about uh, duplicate, uh, unique keys and all that, that this is just completely ignored. So this is going to be more complex initially and it should be because you need to do a lot of things in your program in order to make it possible for it to work correctly in replication. So now let's compare the two to just have all our ideas straight. Native uh, PC soft replication, it's already written. You have way less things to do in your program. It's much faster to implement. There's very little information. and in any case, you will need to test a lot to see how it works, because there's very little information available, and to see if it fits in your case. Um, I didn't read everything again this time. The last time I read the, every, all the information available about the replication, I didn't know at the end if it was a record level or field level replication. I didn't find this information anywhere. For the server to server, I was there when the PCSoft was making a demo and I asked the engineer and he told me it's field level. You would think that it, they would write that in the documentation, but no. So 
So, uh, is it going to fit what you need? Test, uh, which means that you have to implement everything and then decide that it's not good for you. That's okay. okay. Uh, it doesn't support natively any of the advanced problem. That's uh, kind of a given at that point. And if something is not working, not complete, out of date, you are out of luck. Because maybe PCSoft one day will, will correct the problem if they can reproduce it. Otherwise. And clearly, uh, what they did is a one-size-fits-all solution. And I'm sorry, but it doesn't work in software most of the time. So, um, WH replication for each of these points is the exact opposite. It's going to be slower to implement. There is much more information. You don't need to test a lot to see how it works because there, there is an example coming with the project. You have all the projects available. You can see it immediately. And at the end of this course, you should know if it fits your need or not. So basically, you're good. Of course, you can debug, so that's that. Uh, it's written in W language. Currently, it supports a star shape configuration. That means that there's only one level of re replication possible in the current system. It doesn't mean that it won't be possible to do more. It means that it, it is only tested and made for one level of replication currently. So that means that you have all your clients and they all work against one database. Android, Windows, Web Dev, AWP, and Classic support an untested. Transport via HTTP request. Fully encrypted. Now, currently, there is no encryption function available in Android that is compatible with WinDev or Web Dev. The crypt function is there, but it's using completely different algorithm. You cannot crypt on Android and encrypt or decrypt, I'm not sure which one is the right one, because PC stuff is using the wrong one, so I'm always confused. You cannot decrypt in Windows or Web. So we had to write an encryption system. It's an RC4 level encryption. It's not top of the line, but it's good enough for now. Um, and that was done with another sponsor of the, of the project, Michel Garcia. Uh, he's a French guy uh, who's in uh, encryption and some hardware driver module for Windows. So if you need higher level of encryption, is selling higher algorithm, uh, iOS, whatever, all this kind of thing. Here's the, when I have an encryption problem, that's the guy I go to see. So if you need that, there's somebody available for Windows, for the W language. Uh, so it is fully encrypted, even for Android which is something that uh, currently nobody else can do. 20, big announcement, three different type of high-level encryption system available added, Android, WinDev, WebDev. So that is going away in the next version, in the next 12 months. But till then, we still can work. WX replication, big, 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 big point here. We are not supporting automatic IDs. We are supporting GUIDs. Anybody doesn't know what a GUID is? Everybody, everybody is good on that? OK. So that doesn't mean that you have to change your program to uh, suddenly add GUID by hand in your code. The GUID is automatically added to the record when you do an H add by the WX replication system. And I will tell you exactly how later. I'm coming from there and digging more and more. So you will not have more any automatic IDs in your uh, files. That is completely forbidden with WX replication. That's a big change. But I'm giving you also a tool that tells you exactly how to manage the transition. So it's going to be OK. Of course, at that point, you, I'm pretty sure you knew that it was going to work on the field level, because it's the only way to be kind of uh, OK uh, when you transfer data. Last in wins, I already talked about that. 
And one restriction here. You can use queries as much as you want for the select. You cannot use an update query. All the writing in the database has to be done with hadd, hmodify, hdelete. Why? Well, let's take an example. Um, let's say that uh, you want to use an update uh, query to modify not one record, but a series of records. It, it's much faster. Everybody knows that. So on my database, I'm use, using my program, and I'm selecting the record where I want to increase the price by 10%. Okay? I have six records. I say update, add 10% to the price of these six records. Well, if I do that, the only way I have to intercept that information is to intercept the query itself and send the query to the server and execute that same query on the serverless side. The problem during that time, another guy was creating different products. And the select part of my query, the one that allows me to get only the six record to modify, returns eight record on the other side. And suddenly, I'm modifying two records that I didn't choose. And that is just not acceptable. So if we are working with that system, we have to forget completely about updating files with an update query. It just won't work. Which means that you will have to have all your writing done this way. Well, the good thing in that is that it is the recommended way of working in W language. If you look at the help, if you find the right help page, they will tell you that uh, what uh, the, the, the help page is, help system is huge, so you have to find the right one. But they will tell you that what is recommended is to do hreadseq if you're looking for one record, select working for a big data set, and h add h modify h delete for the writing. This, at the same time, allows you to manage lockings, uh, integrity, all this kind of thing that you cannot manage properly in an update request query. So it makes a lot of sense to work that way. Uh, I've never used HTROS in my life, so I didn't think about it. It's not really useful, I don't, I don't feel. But. Um, it's, it is currently not supported. It doesn't mean that it cannot. The, the, the exact same system that is used here could be used for the HTROS system. Now, yeah, that, that, that's exactly that. I'm not sure that HTROS is working on anything else than Hyperfile used it, but not very much. It, it essentially, it's like deleting a record, but it uh, it can be reclaimed, I guess, is the best way to describe it. Yeah, it, it's just like saying, OK, I'm crossing the, the, that line, but the line is still there. You know, it's not physically deleted. It's kind of a, the, what I was talking about earlier, to have, a, to, to, to have a, a checkbox in your record saying it is deleted. It's that. But I don't think that this is exists exist in anything else than Hyperfile. And because I'm trying to have something that works with all database, I don't think I'm going to support that. It should, in fact, it's quite easy to add a, a deleted uh, checkbox in the record and replace the H cross by H modify with that checked. So what will you get? in the WX replication. When you download it, it's one zip file. If you look in the zip file, you have four project backup. There is one WinDev program, which is the example, the thing that is going to be replaced by your program. So that's just a data management program, absolutely normal. Then there is one project, which is the replication engine for the WinDev program. And the replication engine is a separate executable. 
Why? I want to be able to start my program, my user program, and have the replication engine on the side completely independent. This one is going to be started automatically with Windows, so it will replicate data before the user starts his program. It will continue to replicate data after the user stops his program. This way, as long as the PC is uh, open and, uh, of course, the engine is set up to run automatically, it will update the database completely independently of the program being there or not. Um, this is, of course, you could use a service. But then you have permission management, installation problem, uh, lots of things like that. With this system, you can install the whole thing. You can say in your main program, check if the engine is already started, if not started. You can tell the engine to start automatically with Windows. It's just a few lines of code. And that gives you something, even if the engine breaks, uh, is locked because of a HTTP request timeout, whatever, your user will continue to type his data. Doesn't care. That's all. It's, it's the system that is the most reliable that I can think of. Uh, with all the trial that I did during the years, that is the best way, in my opinion, to work. Um, you also get a program which represent what your program under Android will be. And in that case, the replication system is included in it instead of being in a separate executable. Well, several reasons for that. On an Android mobile system, it's going to be much more difficult to have two different programs work on the same database. Uh, also, most of the time, you will not want to have uh, the, the replication system working all the time. It may be the case, but that's quite complex to put in place and that may, may, may create a lot of problems. And so, in this version of the Android program, you just have one button, synchronize, and it does the work once. You want it again? You press the button again. And then finally, you have the last of the four projects, which is a web dev project, it contains only two AWP pages. One is the connection page, and the other is the maintenance page. And that's what you install on your server, where you have your main database, the center of the star. And that's all you need. After that, you have one utility window that is not specifically part of any of these that you will use to test your analysis. Uh, it will automatically check if you have any unique key that you have to modify as not unique key. If you have any automatic ID that you have to remove, it will tell you exactly what you have to do. Uh, it will also allow you to prepare your existing files, because in that system, what I did was make sure that you could incorporate that in a project that is already installed at your customer place. And for that, you need to massage the data to make sure that the old system is correctly replaced by the new system with the GUI and all that. All that is done in that window. And of course, on my website, there is one very important page, step by step, how to integrate your project, uh, the WX replication inside your project. So that is what you get with the uh, the system. Uh, also what you get is the management of the database enrollment. And that is something that is appearing right now, yeah? Right? Perfect. That will, that will do just that. So what is database enrollment? Well, in a replication system, at some point, you have to tell to the system, hey, there is a database there, and you need to replicate with it. So when you're doing that with the uh, 
HF SQL server system, you give the name of the server, you, do, you click here and there. That's the enrollment part. You're saying to your replication system, this database is authorized to replicate data with the system. So there is an example of uh, enrollment system, and we're going to dig into that and see how, it's, how it works. There is also uh, an example of management of the replication administrators. And yes, I know that last year I told you that there was no such thing as a hyperfile administrator, and that's true. But for the replication, you will need somebody to uh, say, OK, this database has the right to do that. This user has the right to see this data. This database is going to publish this and receive that. All that has to be managed by somebody. And for that, you need login, you need permissions, you need all that, and there is an example. Um, you have the possibility to select uh, which file is going to be published or where you're going to receive data. It is a by, by file only at that point. So you're going to be able to say, OK, this client is going to publish his statistic and get his price list, and that's all. It's not going to send everything, receive everything. Um, you have a system that displays the replication history. So you know that uh, the last replication cycle was 10 minutes ago, and the next one, and the next one, and so on. So you can see what, what happened. You have uh, some tools to, for maintenance, test, and debug. Uh, you have a re uh, random record generation tool so that you can simulate user entering data at different speed and test your system uh, under load. You have, in order to verify that your application is working, uh, the possibility to count record per database, per file. A file CRC calculation, 